This is the Trey Blocker Show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Trey Blocker Show. Today, we are honored to have in the studio freshman state representative Carl Sherman from DeSoto, Texas. Representative Sherman has been described as a trailblazer, and the Dallas Urban League has called him one of the most promising leaders of the 21st century. So welcome to the show, Representative. Thank you. Now, those are big statements to live up to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it seems like you are. And, well, uh, I don't know about that. I, I, you know, it's always nice to have folks to write stuff, you know, about you. Uh, but I'm going to try to do my best to uh, live up to those expectations by just being real. Right, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So you are in your first legislative session. You have a long career and history in public service, which we'll talk about. But the first thing I want to ask you is, we're over the halfway mark in the legislative session. I heard someone yesterday say, we're about 50% done with session with 85% of the work left to do. Yeah. <laughs> right. So how do you feel so far? Well, I feel very good. Uh, it, it's This has been a very enlightening uh, experience for me because I've sat on the other side, you know, locally and, and coming down periodically to testify. Uh, but I am uh, I'm amazed at all of the sort of confluence of influence that uh, converges on, you know, every House member, every senator, and, uh, you know, they're a part of your thought process. And the fact that you don't have a lot of time to make decisions right. uh, is is very interesting. Yeah. yeah, I feel good, though, about it. Good, good. Yeah. So before we get too deep into the legislative and political world, let's talk a little bit about your background. You were born in the Dallas area, raised yeah. to a large degree in East Texas. East Texas, and then back to Dallas, and uh, you know, Dallas area, mm -hmm. uh, Ferris and Wilmer, uh, right. Texas. And being the youngest, uh, I uh, got a chance to see some of my uh, siblings' mistakes and learn from them. Right. And uh, they were great tutors for me. <laughs> you know, I always ask guests, what, you know, what was your biggest influence growing up? Would you say it, it was your siblings? No, uh, if it was, I didn't know it. Uh, you <laughs> You're know, not going to give them that much credit. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you know, uh, inherently, you know, they're going to uh, have a lot of influence. But unbeknownst to me, a lot of pastors uh, mm. influenced me. But those were the up close and in person kind of influences. Mm -hmm. But I used to keep newspaper clippings on guys like H. Ross Perot, John H. Johnson of Ebony and Jet magazine, uh, Sam Walton. Yeah. You know, I could tell you, oh, he took his company public October 1st, 1970. I can give you all those stats because I used to keep them. I've been in business since I was five years old. What was your first business? My first business was an art business. <laughs> uh, I could draw. Okay. And uh, so I would sell pictures to the kids in first grade for five cents and 10 cents at the most. And then my friend Richard Maxwell, I'll never forget him, uh, he could draw better than me. And so I made a deal with him. I said, Richard, I noticed that, uh, you know, your pictures are better than mine. Why don't we form a partnership? Uh, I'll sell the pictures if you draw them and I can sell them for 25 cents because they're better. And if I close my business, they don't have any other options. Oh, wow. You know, it was sort of self-preservation, Trey, sure. because I realized that, you know, I noticed his pictures are better. It won't be long before the other kids <laughs> notice it. And so he loved it. We were in business. We were doing well. And then one day he stopped drawing uh, the cartoons and the hot rods. And he started drawing uh, blueprints of homes. I mean, really? he was so good at it. He would draw actually the uh, wiring and plumbing. Turns out his father was an architect. Okay, <laughs> I was and about so, to say. Yeah, so we had a meeting. I said, "Hey, Richard, uh, I can't sell these blueprints." You know, <laughs> you know, we're we're five, six years old now, and he's like, "Well, I don't care. I, I love drawing blueprints." Well, you know, I was out of business because I can't go back to selling the market something that is inferior to what they were used ah, to. Ah, good point. Good yeah. point. And you couldn't find any other artists to recruit. 
I didn't know of any. <laughs> you know, my circle was pretty <laughs> small, uh, but I did start another business and, uh, you know, did very well there and, and just kept, you know, uh, growing and, you know, started a restaurant and uh, at nine and uh, it was Captain started Tools. started a, a restaurant at nine? At nine, yeah. <laughs> okay. Nine years old. Tell me about uh, that. So it was uh, Victor Thomas and Michael Gonzalez uh, and myself, we had a restaurant and they gave me a sailor's cap and the kids would call me Captain Cools. So I figured we'd name the restaurant Captain Cools. Uh, we're doing very well, but you can always do better. So I said sure. to the guys, let's build a balcony because if we build a balcony, the kids will stay and smell the burgers cooking and everything. Now. Another part of this was the fact that, you know, my mom was a single mom uh, and we had beans and cornbread for dinner every day, except on Sundays we would have chicken. Well, I didn't want that being the youngest. I wanted pizza. <laughs> I wanted hot dog. I wanted burgers and right, fries. Right. And so that's how we started that business. We put our resources together. Michael Gonzalez, his father, his grandfather owned a construction business. And so we got all our supplies from him. We had carpet inside. Uh, we built a balcony. Now, where and did you worked. build this restaurant? Right on the side of our house. Okay. So, <laughs> so it's so funny because my mother worked the night shift at a nursing home and she comes home. This is during the summer now. And there is about 18, we got about 18 inches deep because I said to the guys, hey, we're doing so well, let's build a basement. <laughs> so, so we started building a basement and we're 18 inches deep. We had rolled the carpet out because underneath the carpet was mud. And we got all this mud on the side of the house and my mother gets <laughs> home and she says, you know, a few things about why do we always have to have junk on the side of our house? And so we were out of business. But and So did, did you not go back to your other buddy and get some architectural drawings? <laughs> no, that would have been great, but Richard had moved. But you always got to look around. And uh, there was a couple, Larry and Debbie Morgan, okay. uh, that lived in the cul-de-sac. And, she, you know, she stayed at home. They didn't have any children. He went out and worked. So 7 o'clock when the next morning I show up at their house and I knock on her door, she comes to the door, and I said, Miss Debbie, I don't know if you know it, we had a restaurant, we were doing very well. I was wondering if we could use your house for our restaurant. <laughs> she said yes. Are you kidding me? She said yes. <laughs> and so we went from $25 a day to $50 a day because I was able to take all of our food supply and put it in their refrigerator, sure. and I didn't have the IOU notes from my older siblings anymore. <laughs> and we went to the truck stop in town, and I asked the manager there if I could make an announcement about a homestyle burger place. I didn't tell her it was us, our restaurant, mm. and that we were actually cooking on the patio of Larry and Debbie Morgan's. And she said, sure. So I go to the center of the floor, and I said, Excuse me, the manager just told me I could share with you information about a homestyle burger place, restaurant down the street that cooks homemade burgers for 99 cents. Dairy Queen, which was the only place we had in town, uh -huh. their belt buster was $1.25. Uh -huh. My friend and I, the manager said, I could tell you about this. We'll be happy to get your orders and bring them back. We got 10 orders that first day and it oh, never wow. stopped, never abated. And, uh, you know, they never knew that it was kids cooking burgers <laughs> in the backyard. I mean, you must have been cooking some really good burgers. We did all right. Yeah, okay. You know, they were homemade, you know, mayonnaise, ground beef. Uh, I don't even think they had uh, tomatoes on them, you know, <laughs> but they enjoyed them. But, but you know, uh, it's a give and take. One, one day, Michael Gonzalez, and if he's watching this, you know, uh, <laughs> he probably remembers it. I'm, I'm very close. Michael moved South Texas. I'm very close with his brother. Okay. I see Michael take a bag of chips from, you know, the restaurant supplies, right. and he right. puts it in a backpack. So at the end of the day, he gets on his bike to leave. I said, Mike, hey, you took some chips this morning. You, are you going to pay for them? He says, no, I'm not going to pay for them. I own the place. I said, you <laughs> Even though you own it, you know, we can't steal from ourselves. That's right. And if you leave without paying, you're fired. He left. Oh, wow. He was fired. I didn't know you can't fire an owner, but <laughs> he didn't know either, you know. And so, but the last thing I want to say about this, because it ended up, we were out of business again. One morning I show up 
and I always showed up about seven seven thirty in the morning. I right. just love Larry and Debbie Morgan for oh, doing sure. this. If they're still out there, it'd be great uh, to hear from them. I'm counting inventory every right. day, right? And I noticed because we had candy bars too, and I noticed there was a mm. snicker missing from the day before. Mm -hmm. And so I asked Miss Debbie if she knew anything about it. To which she said to Larry, Larry, she hollers, and you know, they were like, the, <laughs> I can see this happening. Yeah, she yeah. says, Carl said there's a snicker missing. Do you know anything about it? Well, Larry said a couple of words I can't repeat, and we were out of business. So, <laughs> so you know, it's a give and take, right? That's right. I mean, that's right. Uh, you got to take care of your landlords. Right. right. That's if he wants right. a snicker bar, he wants a snicker bar. That's right. right? I'm there rent free. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I was a kid. I so didn't you, understand. You clearly were born with an entrepreneurial bug. It sounds like. I guess like. so. Yeah, yeah. I've always, people like H. Ross Perot. Uh, to me, you know, those were my heroes. Sam Walton, uh, you know, he went to every one of his stores, he visited them, they knew him. When he started this store, uh, you know, he, he went against all odds, mm -hmm. you know, That's and right. he would say, you know, swim upstream, go the other way, be prepared though for a lot of folks to wave you down and tell you you're going the wrong direction. Right. And he defied the odds by going to market small cities mm -hmm. And while the Kessler brothers, Kmart, was in the metropolitan areas, and right. we see how Walmart fared. So, sure, sure. Yeah. W what's Kmart? <laughs> <laughs> right, right. I, I think right. Sam Walton did okay for him. So. Yeah, he did. Yeah. He did. So you've been a successful businessman. You know, one of the things that I noticed on your resume that really intrigued me, you are a senior pastor at the Church of Christ near your hometown, and you are a bivocational pastor. Yeah. And I want you to explain to the audience what exactly that means. So uh, my definition of it, first of all, it means you you pastor and you have a, a uh, what someone might say a carnal position. Right. Sure. So that's not how you make ends meet. But it supplements. I mean, so you're you're doing both. And it doesn't necessarily mean you can't make your primary income from pastoring. Right. Uh, but uh, it you serve dual roles. Right. For me, it's been a tremendous opportunity uh, to minister, you know, outside of the pulpit that's inside those four walls. Mm -hmm. You really have to practice uh, the principles that you preach about. Right. To me, it's sort of, it's, I wouldn't say it's made easier, but, you know, you've got to really be committed because sure. you can't, you know, especially today with this new generation where they're Googling, you know, information as you're saying it. Right. So, that's right. That's exactly so, right. You know, you, they're you, fact checking you. That's right. <laughs> that's right. Real time. Right. So you really have to study but uh, being in a position uh, somewhere else, you get a lot of material, you know? That's right. Yeah. Practical material. That's right. Practical sure. material, yes. Well, what drew you to become a pastor? I, I served as a bishop at a church in West Oak Cliff, and uh, there were two of us there who would often be called to preach at a church where they didn't have a pastor or their preacher died or mm -hmm. he went on somewhere else. And so I find myself going. And what started to happen, Trey, was the churches would ask me after my first sermon if I would be their pastor. Oh, wow. And so I started incorporating in my first, in my sort of opening, mm -hmm. that I'm not interested in being anybody's <laughs> pastor and uh but that didn't work you know i was still asked and uh maybe, I, maybe I still god said was no. trying to tell you something yeah yeah he was lord uh you know i thank him for uh his uh grace uh i think romans 2 4 talks about grace that you know it gives us the opportunity to to essentially come to the light to mm -hmm. come to the rev Revelation, we have what we think this spiritual epiphany that happens, but the Lord's been tapping you on That's your right. shoulder for a while. That's right. And uh, I was more self willed then than I am now. <laughs> uh, and I try to make sure that I let Him guide my footsteps. After all, if you know, if your first opinion is from God, you don't need a second opinion. That's, so. that's absolutely yeah. right. So I read an interesting article about bivocational pastors, and, yeah. and it was actually an argument for that model. And, really? and part of the argument was, it, it's kind of like a part-time legislature. 
mm. right? You do your pastoring on Sunday, but then you go out into the workplace, into the secular world, and, and you share those principles through your actions. Yeah. And that's, that's true ministry right there. Yeah, I, I think that's, uh, that's well stated. Uh, it, it does provide you those practical experiences where you can provide the practical application because too often the, the scriptures come across as too lofty right. and theory. Right. So you get a chance to really uh, demonstrate, you know, it, it may require you to be committed and dedicated, but it's, you can do it as mm -hmm. long as you're not doing it on your own. That's right. That's yeah. right. You, you would need a good support system. So I right. have to ask you, now that you've been elected to the Texas House and you were down here for the legislative session, how does your background as a bivocational pastor play into what you do down here, if at all? Yeah, it plays a lot. Our, our walk with the Lord is one that, you know, he, he's always there guiding us. Right. You know, there's a lot of white noise that's happening, mm -hmm. but you've got to be focused and, and hear him. And he's not always shouting and screaming. That's right. It could be a whisper, you right. know, and, and uh, I'm not talking about audible. I'm not hearing things. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> but, but you've got to be uh, spiritually discerning, I think, sure. uh, to recognize when the Lord is, is guiding you. Uh, I mentioned earlier, there are a lot of influences mm -hmm. and you've got to constantly remind yourself that our fight is not with flesh and blood. I hear people get into disagreements philosophically, uh, and that's okay, you know, but I can never get married to my view of life because, you know, then I may fall into this sort of translucent view of things. Mm thinking that my perspective is the way they are. Right. And it's just my perspective based on my experiences and my background. And I don't ever want to be holier than thou uh, and self-righteous. But if I'm not, you know, if I get married to my own uh, ideas, mm -hmm. and, and this is something I try to live by, I'm only married to two and I'm not a polygamist. Uh, I'm married to the <laughs> Lord and my wife. Right. And everything else can come and go, including my own ideas. Huh. They have to be challenged because I think uh, there was a quote that I uh, read. Uh, it's what you learn after you know it all that counts. <laughs> I like so, that. So, you know, I try not to be married to positions. I should, I should grow. Right. I, I should. Well, there, there are 181 legislators in that building, all with differing opinions. Yeah. So there's a, there's a lot to learn from other folks. Yes, Representative Sherman, we are in the heat of session, and I know you are on a tight time frame today, and we need to let you go. But I want to ask you, what are you working on this session? What's important to your district? Yeah, so uh, I appreciate that because what I'm working on is what's important to my district. Good. You know, uh, there are technical revocation. This is an issue that uh, I think President uh, Donald Trump has championed in regards to prison reform, mm -hmm. uh, criminal justice reform. One of the saddest stories I heard about, you know, our prison system, uh, and, and there are several, I mean, uh, the heat conditions in right. our prison, uh, which I've co-authored uh, with Canali, uh, House Bill 936. You know, we've got 104 prisons, 75 of them do not have ACs. Mm. And I don't care, you know, who you are. As a former city manager, I'll tell you, with our animal shelters, we had to keep them cooled. Right. These are animals. People are not animals. Right. So when temperatures rise to 120, 130 degrees in our prisons, uh, I think God's going to hold us accountable. And not everyone we have incarcerated is guilty. We've mm -hmm. had a record number of exonerations. Mm -hmm. And so without the help of DNA, right. you know, these eyewitness testimonies have locked up several people because, again, we think our view is translucent. We, we believe, I know what I saw. Right. I get it wrong sometimes. And, and I, I've said this, we had a choice. I'm talking about 
over 2,000 years ago. Uh. There was a trial, and we couldn't even get that right. <laughs> you know, we, we chose Barabbas. <laughs> That's right. So when we just had two. So for those 145,000 souls that we have locked up in prison, some for heinous crimes, mm -hmm. uh, some that are innocent because we didn't get it right, sure. some that made some stupid decisions, but we should at least provide a humane situation for them because right. scripture says in Romans 12, 19, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Right. I mean, uh, I, what I can do, what Trey Blocker can do to anybody, doesn't compare to what God can do to fix them. That's true. Uh, and, and we want people to be redeemed, uh, not annihilated. The Lord uh, would that all men might be saved. So I want to do my utmost to improve those uh, conditions. I, you know, there, there are a lot of things. I, I'm working on, uh, some folks think, you know, you're a closet Republican, uh, <laughs> you know, because I, I've got a bill uh, of, that's an exemption for franchise tax, Okay. but I believe in it. I think we got to figure out how to marry good causes with good benefits for mm -hmm. businesses. And my uh, bill 3823 does that, I believe. It allows a company to be exempted from franchise tax while if they provide maternity leave four weeks for their mother. Ah. And this, the impetus for this was, you know, I've got some business owners back in my district, some that own fast food restaurants, right. banks, right. Uh, that, you know, they would provide uh, that kind of leave for their mothers that, that have a child and the spouse for two weeks if they had some help. And, sure. you know, I think that's a good cause. I call it family first, right. you know, that you can help them because some of these mothers are because of their jobs you know their their income they have to be back on a job within two weeks mm -hmm. because they can't afford to lose the pay right you know i know there are a lot of groups out there telling me you need six weeks and you need eight weeks <laughs> and you know in the netherlands we have 52 weeks or whatever right. well look you know we're not in the netherlands and i'm just trying to you know, do something for business and family, and I think they can work together. That's right. So Well, and it's a carrot, not a stick, is that's what right. you're proposing, which is good. I've often said we need more business people in the legislature because it's easy to make laws that affect business uh, adversely yeah. when you've never run a business, <laughs> right? Right. We ne absolutely need more business people in the legislature, so I'm glad you're here. I'm well, glad you. you're serving. I greatly appreciate you coming on this show in such a, a busy time of the session. Well, and I, I hope you'll come back when we have more time to sit and chat. Um, I appreciate but that. But for now, I'm going to have to let you go. And a, as you know, it's a tradition on the Trey Blocker Show to wrap up each episode with some words of wisdom from our special guests. So do you have anything you'd like to share with our audience? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I'm bivocational pastor, so uh, there's a scripture, uh, Acts 17, where Paul uh, is speaking, and he says, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is he worshipped with man's hands as though he needed anything, seeing that he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and had made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth and had determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation that they should seek the Lord if happily they might find him though he be not far from every one of us for you know I, that to me puts it all back in focus that we all came from one blood right so we spent all this time talking about our differences, mm -hmm. but the genesis of our lives comes from one blood. We've just been spread out. So, you know, we got to figure out how to reconcile, right. and we do a great job of breaking up things. <laughs> well, we do, and, and hopefully you can, you can be a part of reconciliation in the legislature when it's needed. It seems like everybody's getting along right now, and that's great. Yeah. But I have a feeling your services will be needed here in the next 30 <laughs> to 60 days. So, again, thank you for sharing the, the verse, and thank you for coming on the show.
Thank you. Thank you. And thank you all for watching and listening to The Trey Blocker Show. You can find us at TreyBlockerShow.com, YouTube, and your favorite podcast app. Thank you, and God bless. This has been The Trey Blocker Show. Please subscribe on YouTube or your favorite podcast app and visit TreyBlockerShow.com to donate so we can keep fighting to restore sanity to this great nation.